briefly about myself. I come to you from the United States. Um, I just, you know, I have a master's degree from Brandeis University. I've been working with databases forever. Uh, as a matter of fact, once you get to a certain point in your career, you realize that you no longer want to tell people how many years you've been working with it. So if you really want to know, you can solve that equation. Uh, I made it a little tricky. I hope it is a little tricky. So depends how well you remember your algebra. Some of the companies I worked for uh, in the past, some might be familiar to you, some might not be. Um, chief mom officer um, to a couple of kids and a dog and a husband. I am a huge fan of Star Wars. You'll probably see that through my presentation. And uh, please connect to me through LinkedIn. I would love to talk to, you know, similar, you know, people working on the same things and share information. So currently, I work for a company called Indigo. Uh, we want to harn harness the nature to help farmers sustainably feed, feed the planet. We work with microbiology and software, and there are a lot of diff different uh, facets. Uh, I could probably talk about it for an hour, but the session is not about that. So if you're curious about Indigo, please reach out as well. Uh, we do have quite a few open positions. So our story, um, when I joined Indigo Body just a little over a year ago, uh, I, one of the main reasons why I joined Indigo is because they already, I apologize for all the noises, uh, because they already had Snowflake and I was super excited about the tech. Uh, what I walked in is what I call a junkyard, but you know, I have some other names for it, you know, like, ODS, data lake, data swamp, snow, snow house, whatever you call it, but this is what we had. We had hundreds of data sources that were flown into Snowflake through different pipelines. We had super complex views that each team had to write to cleanse data and format it in the way they needed to be, which ended up in a lot of redundancy, inconsistency. Everybody was doing their own data discoveries. Um, we have scratch space. Uh, which I'm sure everybody has scratch space. It's sort of a, as a matter of fact, every user that has um, account in Snowflake gets their own scratch space. It's, it's their sandbox to prototype quickly, load data, you know, do whatever they need with it. But as you can see, because there's really no barrier for entry, everybody starts using it for like tools. And now all of a sudden we see applications that rely on scratch um, data. We load a lot of, lot of data from G sheets, which in Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, so it probably sounds familiar, um, super painful. And also um, the company is still very young, more of a startup, things just change constantly we're working in areas that are not well defined. So a lot of it is sometimes we discover things, so we have to change. Uh, a lot of times we just, you know, in a very startup mode where we just change things all the time. <clears throat> so now close your eyes and imagine the place where you had a single place for trusted data, a place where you were confident that data was curated tested, monitored, where it was clearly organized and intuitive to navigate. A world where you can spend your time doing your job of making important decisions based on data. So this is what my dream is. So how do we get from the place where we were to the place we just dreamt about? They basically told me that I can't blow things up, that it's not okay. So we decided to go with the data vault. So why was data vault the right solution for us? When I walked in a year ago into Indigo, we were just starting to talk about data warehouse. So we were going to meetings um, to create logical, dimensional data warehouse design. Every time we would go to that meeting, we would talk to our stakeholders. They would describe, you know, concepts and measures. And then a couple of days later, we'll go into the meeting with the same stakeholders and they'll give us new concepts and new measures. And a month or two months into trying to come up with a logical design, we still couldn't. We couldn't get past 
writing things on the board to actually coding them. While that was happening, I came across a blog by Ken Graciano in Snowflake saying that, yes, you can build the data vault in Snowflake. And I said, well, wait a minute, I know what Snowflake is, I don't know what data vault is. So I started digging into it, reading about it, bought a book, uh, watched some YouTube videos, and I got super excited about it because data vault kind of walking away from source systems and trying to define business concepts and being, <clears throat> excuse me, very agile was our chance to actually make progress in our rapidly changing environment. So what's good? We already had a Snowflake. Snowflake is fantastic. I'm super excited about Ken talking to us next time about it. Um, Data Vault actually is familiar concepts. You know, we working with databases for a long time. You know, I know, you know, third normal form. I know primary key, you know, foreign key relationships. Um, stage staging environment is kind of like a typical data load patterns for data warehouse. It was very familiar concepts. And the fact that it was agile, I was sold on it. So the other thing that was kind of good for us is that we didn't have anything. It really didn't matter. It was very low risk for us to try something. So we have Greenfield Development. Uh, we started from nothing. I any path forward was a good path forward. Um, the next thing about um, Data Vault is very, it, it truly makes me happy. I, I did a lot of years being, I uh, worked a lot of years as a DBA and part of being a good DBA is you never actually delete or update anything without saving a copy of the previous, um, of the way data looked because, uh, you know, there's always a chance and somebody will come to you a couple of weeks later and say, hey, can you roll it back? So I call it data hoarding, but it's, it's actually a good thing. It made me happy that you preserve data as is, as it comes to you so that, you know, you can change your mind and, and change your data mart views later, but you still have your raw data in the format that came to you. We already, our data pipelines, we, we use views in Snowflake. We just very, very heavy into views. So the concept of creating a data mart view on top of raw data vault was actually also very comfortable for us. That's what we've been doing. Uh, data world methodology is super agile. As we started kind of diving into it, we, <clears throat> we said, all right, well, excuse me, let's pick a business concept. Let's try to define it. Let's build it. Um, a month or two later, we realized that, you know, we missed some things. We didn't do them correctly. We were slowly adding links and satellites and hubs to our data vault without really affecting anything. It, it, it's really amazing. You know, my colleague would create, you know, a link and then later on, uh, you know, we would learn that the grain was incorrect. So we'd create a new link and we'll repoint our views and there is no overlaps. We're not stepping on anybody's toes. We don't have to run those scary, massive full loads that we used to do back in more traditional data warehouse days. Um, I, I described the story to you where things were constantly changing and we couldn't get past the logical model. Things are still changing and a lot of our tools and um, that capture data are changing. So we've kind of given up on trying to map that and we started using JSON uh, variant data type in our satellites. We'll just take whatever data is sent to us. We'll extract certain elements that we we'll want to display in views. And it's been super, super easy to just continually develop for us without having our processes break all the time because the upstream schema changes. And the other thing that we use is um, metadata JSON. So when you have a source column where you have the name of the source system, we actually expanded it a little bit and we're now adding um, source system, source table, um, source columns, so that at a glance you can quickly see where data is coming from. So what's been bad? Uh, small community. 
I actually have to say that I'm thankful to COVID for giving me a chance to connect to you, all of you across the world. It's extremely exciting. Uh, Data Vault is not particularly widely known in the United States. And I come from like SQL Server background with enormous community. So that's been pretty hard to kind of like ask questions, share ideas. I mean, there's a good amount of information online, but still not quite enough. Um, many tables, we kind of knew that was going to happen going into it, but when we ended up with like 100 tables, uh, it was a bit of a shock to the system, but that's okay. Um, hashed keys versus unique primary keys. We're part of it, like having a background in SQL Server, um, hashed keys and unique keys kind of like tell me fragmentation. This is going to be fragmentation. That's not the case with Snowflake, but we're still unsure what's more efficient whether we want to hash primary key or actually just use um, unique primary key. So we ended up doing both. That's the beauty of Snowflake. We right now, all of our tables have both and uh, we'll figure out as our data vault grows, which way we want to go. As I was preparing the slides, uh, my 10 year old looked at it and he said, well, Jar Jar Bings is not ugly. He's just unique. So what's been unique in our uh, process is that while Greenfield development gave us a lot of flexibility to try stuff without really like much risk, it's also been extremely hard because nothing has been defined. Defining business concepts in the company that's moving at the speed of light is so, so hard. And we, <laughs> The funny thing is like we started, we said, okay, so, you know, Indigo is a company, we have customers, let's see if we can model customers. And it turns out that it's probably one of the hardest things to model. We get customer related information from six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different systems. And there really isn't a unique set of attributes to define a customer. So we ran straight into the thing where we actually do have to use source system IDs prefixed by the source system, which led us right into the same as link situation. And same as links are quite hard to query, to flatten them and, and present like a user-friendly view. So that, that's that been pretty interesting. And I think the other thing is lack of automation. The, the patterns are pretty consistent and the copy pasting of everything over and over again is just a nightmare. It's annoying, it's boring. Uh, you make mistakes that are completely silly. It causes a consistency. So this is kind of where we are right now. Um, everything is green is what we've had and I called it ODS for lack of a better word of how our Snowflake instance is configured. And in light blue, I hope it shows in light blue is what we're slowly adding. As you can see, we're pretty in early stages of our data vault. We have raw data vault. We are missing a lot of key components. So that's what the next steps are. Um, Automation, more automation, a lot of automation. I'm looking forward to the session about um, DBT. Um, and we will talk about persistent staging areas when, as well as creating some operational data vault. So, okay. So, hello, my name is Adam Smith. I'm uh, the uh, BI architect at Tokyo Marine HCC, which is a, it's a specialty insurance company headquartered in Houston, but um, the international se segment is in um, the UK. We work out of London, but we've got companies in around Europe um, and we write business in Lloyd's. So we, so we insure so everything, so commercial insurance, so things like oil rigs, uh, events, property, racehorses, baseball players, kidnap and ransom, um, things like that. Um, I've been working in data warehousing for around 15 years, um, and uh, most of that's been in insurance. And so I'm going to take you through the story of, or the, the sort of recent history of 
warehousing at TMHCC um, since since I've been around, um, and show you show you like where we've why we've ended up um, uh, deciding to go with Data Vault for the for the new version. So I I was involved in in this this data warehouse that's still still there today. Uh, we built it about ten years ago, um, and some of it's good, some of it's bad. You'll we'll see where it ends up. Um, so we built an enterprise data warehouse. That's what people were asking for at the time. Um, people weren't asking for operational reporting, um, although we soon found out that that's what they actually want. Um, so in here, so the UW1, that's, the, that's our source system, that's an underwriting system. Um, so what we're doing here is we loaded, we're loading that through data stage, used all the IBM tools into a data warehouse, it's highly normalized. Um, and then made one big data mark at the end um, and applied some logic on the way through and built some reports. And this was all done with a small BI team um, quite cheaply, uh, quite quickly. So I'll take you through what happens next. So, so the, next, the next bit is put in the next system. Um, and so the challenge here is here that we've, although we've made a business model here, now we've got to make sure that everything conforms from the second system. So you've got hundreds of attributes, you've got to conform them, find, find a similar field between the two systems, stick them in. And, and we start to load downstream systems. So we're loading the, down, the, uh, the general ledger. And this is where we start to put in more logic. So we, we've snuck in some finance logic um, on the way into the general ledger. Now the downside of that is that if you're looking at a report, you're going to see a different number in the GL. Um, but at this point, it's all still quite smooth. It's quite a small user group and a very small BI team. And it grows. So we get more systems. Um, the user group grows. Still quite a small team. Um, I think I left around this time because uh, it's pretty repetitive by this time. It's quite, it's quite easy. It's, it sort of works. Um, and and we're loading all the core systems. So at this point, the exec like it. Um, it means that uh, they can do they can do an acquisition with confidence, and they know that they can put any system into this, and it'll only take a few months. But we're putting more and more logic in. And now today, so now we've got nine source systems. We've got logic everywhere. Um, um, we've got a very large BI team. We probably spend more per year now on supporting this with no changes than we than it costs to create the thing in the first place. Um, if anyone wants to know uh, where a field comes from, they have to look through hundreds of data stage jobs. Um, we've just lost, we don't, don't have any data lineage. And because of some design decisions in the underlying systems, uh, we've got a much increased demand for operational reporting. People just want to see the data that they're putting in the system now. Um, whereas before it was more, they wanted the group level view. Now there's a huge demand for that. Just show me the data that I'm typing in. This, leads us to the drivers of why, why so this is sort of the, some of the thinking of what drives us towards data vault as a solution. A conceptual data model in the, in the data warehouse that we've got worked okay. It hardly changed over those 10 years. So we'd like to reuse it, at least the high level model, data model. Um, we see that conforming attributes across nine systems is very expensive and and mostly pointless. Um, we need to conform maybe 20 attributes for the finance team, but we don't have to conform 200 or 1,000 attributes. But we do still need to conform because we need to be able to, we, we don't want to lose that ability to plug in a system quickly and get it loading those downstream core systems. Um, and we've still got a strong need for structured reporting. We don't do a lot of 
then no one's really asking for analysis yet. We're still concentrating on the basics, like how much money have we got? How much money do we owe? How much have we got in reserve? Um, so with these, maybe the top, all these points, um, a, a data lake didn't really seem like the right fit. Um, so we'll go, yeah, we need to support operational as well as enterprise reporting. So that's just being able to people give people access to the, the raw data or the, or the history of the raw data. And to be able to separate the, the business logic. So in the slide before, we've got logic everywhere and it's been put in by uh, developers. So they've chosen to split logic up. And so some logic will be in step one, some will be in step three, just because that was performance. But it's very difficult to explain what we've done to the business. So that sort of transparency, the data lineage and the auditability, uh, the major focuses for us. And also we want to use an existing met methodology where possible. We don't want to invent anything from scratch. Someone clever has already worked this out. So um, we don't need to make the same, make mistakes if someone else has already worked it out. So I think data vault is relevant to all of these and they, it helps us with, with all these points. So this is what we're looking at now. So we're building on Snowflake. So we're still early days. Um, we've, uh, we've settled on some, uh, some, some software, putting together the high, sort of high level designs and this is how we think it's gonna work, but um, we haven't built very much yet, um, apart from POCs. So we're on Snowflake, so we get to use their streams and tasks. So you've got source tables have been replicated um, in real time uh, by a re replication tool. Um, you can put a stream on all of those, um, which is just like a CDC kind of view. You can see, see all the changes that have happened in the table since you last looked. And then the, a task is a bit like a stored procedure, but it comes with a schedule. Um, and so the task says, well, if there's something changed in the, oh, run every minute, and if there's something changed in the stream, then run this stream, then run these inserts. So that takes us to the staging table and then a task to do the inserts into the hub link satellites um, triggered by this task finishing completely. So then you get you get a real near real time load. So if you're running every minute. Um, we're loading the hubs link satellites in parallel. So business logic, we're looking at a tool called InRule. Um, we've, we've done some POCs. It looks like it might be a really good fit. It um, looks like it fits into the sort of business world concept really well. Um, and the nice thing about it is, you, so you can, really, you can get the business to maintain logic, calculations, etc., in InRule. And the nice thing about it is that you can then export those, well, you can run those rules through an API or you can export them as JavaScript. And of course, JavaScript works on Snowflake. So we can deploy that JavaScript as, um, as functions on, onto Snowflake. And that completes the load. So we have a load backwards, back from the data vault into staging via the, um, the functions. And then we can reuse this, this pattern uh, to, to load into the business vaults and computed satellites. So we've, uh, this is, this is the, the tools we're using. So Attunity Replicate we're using for replication, just a simple CD, uh, uh, database log based replication. Um, we're using Erwin to generate um, all of these parts, the streams, tasks, the staging tables, the data vault, the business vault, and um, in rule for, for the, the business logic. So this is optimistic, but the whole, in this picture, the whole thing, 100% automated, and we don't need to do any SQL ourselves, but we'll see how that turns out. So this is where we are so far. So we've, we are about to start some of this. We, we built a pilot right at the beginning. Um, we just built it using um, do, as coding ourselves with Python and so on. Um, that was well received. So that's uh, how we got funding for the, for the project. InRule seems interesting. So um, 
I'll, I'll have to report back of how that works. Um, but it, it's, it just seems to fit into the business fog concept. But um, we haven't actually got it working yet. Snowflake's easy. Um, it's just, uh, we've all got backgrounds in SQL, so it's just, it's really, it's really nice to be able to use something in the cloud and understand what to do straight away. Um, the automation's really important to, to control the size of our, of our team, you know, get down from a large number to a smaller team again. The data vault modeling is not so easy, even after doing the certification, so we did need to ask for help. So luckily we've got Neil helping us out. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it has been really useful. And, uh, and similarly to uh, Veronica, it can be difficult to find the, um, the, the latest recommendations. But we are getting a lot of interest in data vault and uh, acceptance from the business, which surprisingly have, have um, been really supportive. Thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you, Adam. All right, so uh, thanks, uh, Neil, and, and also Mark uh, for having us. Um, first thing I wanted to say, and then a, a quick intro. Um, so my name is Jonas. Um, I, I represent Voltspeed, um, and I started off with uh, Data Vault. Uh, I think it was back in 2013, 2014, somewhere. Um, Back then I worked for the Agile Information Factory, which is a uh, data warehouse consultancy group in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and within uh, this company, um, we created a, a data warehouse automation tool called Foldspeed. Um, today, uh, we would like to present to you one of our customer cases, um, the case at Argenta. And I would also like to introduce uh, Tim Scott. Uh, Tim is program manager at Argenta for the, the data warehouse or data tra transformation project. Um, and I would like to give a word to him. He will uh, explain a, a little bit about the customer and the, and the challenges uh, they are facing. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing us to take here a few of your moments of your time. Uh, I'm Tim Scott, uh, indeed, program manager at Agenta. Uh, my history is mainly um, core banking, IT, and uh, data migrations. Uh, so this, but for the past two years, I've been. Uh, working on this uh, program for, uh, for Agenta. Agenta is uh, one of the five largest banks in Belgium, but that's not saying a lot because Belgium is not very, very large in itself. Uh, I could present you some key figures here. I'm not going to read them to you. I think uh, it's to give you an idea, but uh, about 2,500 people working there, 440 branches, but also a very increasing, uh, increasingly important uh, online and uh, mobile uh, presence. In the past years, uh, Agenta has taken the ambition to become more and more a data-driven uh, organization, uh, which is the future of uh, a lot of uh, companies. Uh, so, uh, of course, within banking, that is also important. And uh, they've decided to, uh, to do that in a structured way to grow uh, in a structured way towards a data-driven organization. You can go to the next slide, uh, Jonas. Yeah. And to do that, uh, they started uh, this program to uh, roll out uh, data management uh, within the organization. So that step-by-step, step, um, they could allow their organization to grow within uh, as, as a data-driven organization. And for that, they started with three key pillars uh, that really are necessary to, um, to allow this. And that is one of them is to find data, to be able to know where the data is, know which data you have, know where it's stored and how you can access it. Um, to roll out a sort of service organization that will allow you to uh, or allow users to find their data and uh, do dashboarding and build reports with them. Uh, autonomously and of course making sure that all your data is available of course having data is not enough you have to know what it's about you have to know what you can do with it you have to know where you where you can use it for uh, what is what it's uh, what it's about so uh, different components are rolled out uh, also uh, to 
ensure that the data can be understood as a large business glossary being uh, built. We need to support that uh, lineage also from a BCBS 239 um, compliance requirement for banking. And of course, there's uh, more and more data discovery being done uh, within the organization. Having data and knowing what it's about uh, is not enough if you are not able to trust it. So we need really to be able to monitor uh, in a most automated way the data quality uh, of the data that we use, but not only monitor it, but also having people responsible for the data, knowing what it's about and managing the data behind it. These three pillars are absolutely a key necessity uh, uh, within Agenta, but within a lot of companies to be able to use data. Uh, if you do not know what it's about, if you don't know where you can find it and you're not able to trust it, uh, you will not be able to use the data in reports, in applications, in integration, in uh, anything you want to use uh, data for. For banks, of course, it's uh, one very important aspect of using data is the regulatory reporting that is mandatory for us to do. Uh, but of course, giving correct and usable data uh, to your organization allows you to service your clients, allows you to uh, make sure that you uh, react quickly on the data and that you can provide a uh, reliable legal reporting. One of the key aspects in becoming data driven is, of course, to have your data available. And uh, the key element in there is a uh, new data warehouse that we're building to replace uh, the old data warehouse, which uh, actually was pretty well described by uh, Adam in his previous presentation. Um, with a lot of logic from the start to the finish, with a lot of data distributed, with a lot of history uh, in it but also a lot of history in, in the logic that's in it. And uh, Jonas will now show you how we, um, how we coped with that uh, building new, a new data warehouse and how we wanted to avoid redoing all the things we did in the past and uh, making sure that we can build a future-proof data warehouse. Jonas, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Um... So we had to build a new data warehouse um, and of course we had to choose for, um, for the methodolo methodology to use. Um, and, and there were a few requirements that were um, put, put on by, by business. Um, so you can, you can see them on, on this slide and um, I will gradually explain why, why all of these requirements um, kind of pointed in the way of, of data vault. So there's not one solution that, that's going to fit every requirement perfectly, but um, Data Vault for us seemed to be the best fit um, to solve um, this, this challenge. Uh, first of all was that um, the data warehouse needs to support business needs. So they wanted a, a global overview of their data. Um, they wanted to use it as a, a marketplace where they could do uh, self-service to get to, to have access to certain data sets. Um, speed of delivery was also important. Um, uh, organization, uh, an organization like Argenta is changing uh, a lot, so um, we had to be able to adapt to these changes quickly. Um, data warehouse need to be, needed to be scalable and extensible, so um, they couldn't just start off with uh, the, a big bang and just create a, a data warehouse right from, from scratch. Uh, they wanted to do it gradually um, with an, an agile way of working. Um, and that's how we had to do the integrations. Um, so uh, had to be scalable, which is also um, a, a key aspect and, and Data Vault supports that very well. Um, secure, security and robustness. Um, security speaks for itself. Um, there's, there's a lot um, going ar uh, around about cybersecurity and, and uh, privacy issues and stuff like that. Um, especially for uh, the banking sector, this is, this is of course really important. Um, you, you, you're storing data about, uh, about people's savings account and stuff like that. So you, you really have to be careful with that. Um, also, Argenta has, has some um, big um, applications, source applications that are built and are being built and maintained in-house. 
um, but also their, their external data sources, um, they, they tend to change a lot over time. So the data warehouse had to be resilient to these changes. Um, also a big plus there for data vault, of course. Um, it had to be future proof. So um, the main thing here or a question they, they had is that it had to fulfill future needs now. So um, not every need, um, when you start building your data warehouse, you don't really know exactly every future need that you will have. Um, so they, they try to support these future needs as much as possible um, when, when we're building it right now. Um, a history of change there is, is a key aspect. Um, they, they wanted to have a complete um, change of history. Um, the other, the, the next two are, are quite nice. So they, they were, it had to be simple. Um, building a data warehouse is of course never, never simple, but you can make it, you can make it more easy for yourself. Um, so they wanted to work in an agile way. Uh, they wanted easy, uh, they wanted it to be easy to code. Um, maintain it had to be maintainable cost effective and um, they wanted to automate wherever they they could um, so the the repeatable patterns that that are key in data vault um, also also fit very well in this in this uh, necessity um, they wanted a standardized way of working so it had to be well documented um, they wanted to use textbook methods so no cowboy stuff here um, everything had to be standard um, as said previously, Argenta really wants to install a data culture. Um, so a proper data governance had to be set up, metadata management uh, was set up and, and uh, key business people were involved to become uh, data stewards. Um, and of course, uh, we're in the banking sector, so there's lots of legal frameworks to apply to. Um, regular aud audits, so data had to be fully auditable. And all of these aspects um, pointed in the way of all, all of these aspects together uh, pointed in the way of data vault. So we, we came up with an architecture um, that's built around, around this um, raw data vault. Um, and, and yeah, you can immediately see when you look at an architecture like this and you have to start off a project, um, you have to start doing a lot of things at the same time. So you have uh, people that are working um, on the CDC systems um, people that, that worked with, um, with VoltSpeed to do the automation in, uh, in, into the raw data vault and, and parts of the business data vault. Um, we had to take care of our release management, but also the flow management um, had to be set up. So um, you're doing a lot, lots of things at the same time. Um, and for us, it's, it's really important, or when we look back, it was really important that we were able to to learn and experiment in this phase. Because when you start building a, a data warehouse, um, it's like a, a, train that, a train that has to start moving. So um, when a train is leaving a train station, that's exactly when it's using the most energy, when it needs to accelerate. Um, and I think it's the same for, for large data warehousing projects. Um, you'll have to invest uh, a lot of energy in the beginning of such a project. Uh, just to get uh, started in the right way and you have to be able to learn you have to be able to experiment and also um, adapt to uh, whatever you you learn um, the thing we did with the the data governments and uh, data lineage is also quite cool so um, we uh, set up um, a proper data lineage um, which allowed us to uh, incorporate this into a, a Colibra, which is a, a data governance tool where we have full, um, a full overview of uh, every data element that is uh, brought into the data warehouse. Uh, we also have the lineage for those data elements. Um, and we have the data stewards actually uh, defining those data elements, so explaining what they are, uh, but also uh, writing data quality rules for those uh, elements, um, which is then uh, processed by a data quality tool um, to, to safeguard the quality of the data. Um, our stakeholders um, use uh, export files or the dashboard reporting um, to, to get access to the data, uh, but they can also explore the data if they want to, um, it's all possible. Next slide. Uh, one of the things we experimented with a little bit was um, our sprint approaches. So we started off with what we call a multi-speed approach. 
Um, it's actually where you have technical sprints and functional sprints. The technical sprints, um, they're we focused on uh, so a source system and just try to incorporate that source system into the raw data vault as quickly as possible. Um, and then in the functional sprints, uh, we would do the rest of the work and, and to actually deliver the business value. Um, but what we saw was that we, we got too much uh, or, or we put too much focus on these uh, raw data vault sprints, which allowed us to grow the data vault really quickly. Um, but we didn't invest enough in the functional sprints. Um, and that's exactly what we had to do, what we had to deliver. We had to deliver the business value. So uh, along the way, we switched to the functional sprint approach, um, where we would just take a limited set of objects based on functional requirements and do um, the, the work that needed to be done to incorporate it right until the end, right to where we delivered the business value. So in the beginning, you have to uh, do a lot of uh, these raw data vault to access layer sprints um, because you don't have that much yet in your raw data vault. But gradually, when your data warehouse starts to grow, um, uh, you will have more cases where you already have um, attached certain elements into the raw data vault where you just need to add some business logic or even less. Um, and that's where you uh, see that your time to market starts to get better. Um, along the way where you're building your data warehouse. So um, due to the automation, we were quite quickly in um, building our, our raw data vault, but where we still um, lost too much time was actually in the, uh, the making the data available in a presentation layer or an access layer. And um, that was mainly because we, we were still using the more traditional way of persisted star schemas and things like that. Um, so we started experimenting with uh, virtual data marts. And to do virtual data marts, you need uh, pit tables and bridge tables. Um, so what, what we decided to do was actually create uh, pit tables and bridge tables based on uh, snapshots, um, which allowed us to actually create our virtual dimensions on top of our satellites and our pits and our bridge tables. And when you clear away the persisted part of that, you, you see that you, you get your virtual star schema built um, in that way. Um, we used snapshots um, because the business was really fond of it. So we explained uh, the possibilities to them, but um, they really liked the snapshots because um, we proposed a, a way where we would, uh, for recent data, provide like daily snapshots, so daily views of uh, the data. Um, and for periods that were further away in time, uh, we would do uh, end of months or even end of year uh, snapshots. Um, cool thing about this, which I also liked, was that, for example, when you get an audit and someone, somebody wants to see a certain data set uh, exactly as it was back in 2015, for example, you can just load a certain snapshot into the um, pit, pit and bridge tables and it's readily available uh, in your dashboards or in your reports. Um, so using snapshots is really a way to, to move from the continuous timeline that you have in your raw data vault to uh, a discrete timeline where you yourself decide uh, how many snapshots you have loaded readily. And if you don't have them loaded, you can just um, uh, load them, load them uh, upon a user uh, request. So lots of advantages we've, we found in the virtualization. Um, it's very standardized, it's easy to learn and easy to use. So it reduces your time to market, it's very maintainable. Um, you actually make better use of the history that's uh, stored in your raw data vault because with, with persisted star schema, it's always a hassle to get the intervals right and, and stuff like that. Um, the possibility to offer multiple timelines is also there. So you can use um, business timelines, but also technical timelines or bi-temporal. Uh, you can do all that. Um, some other examples um, uh, uh, is actually that it's, it's a very good fit for edge health teams because you can do easy prototyping. Um, if, you, if you automate your pits and your bridges and you want to uh, build a a dimension is just writing a view, so it's very easy to to test and to throw away if it doesn't really uh, doesn't really work out. 
Um, one important thing with virtualization is that you should set it up correctly. So um, there is a performance impact um, because it has to do more querying at uh, read time. Um, but when you set it up correctly, that's, uh, that impact should, should be acceptable. Um, we're still working a bit on that, but um, it's going in the, in the right direction. So from this uh, presentation, we can give a few lessons and, and recommendations. So first of all, take your time to learn and adapt and actually keep learning because you'll always find uh, things that, that can be done better or, or uh, that you should do differently. Um, you should plan your integration based on functional requirements and not just dump every source system into the raw data vault and, and then see where, where, you, where you are. Uh, and then also standardize and automate wherever you can because it will significantly uh, improve your time to market. And that was it. So um, 